So there's a super interesting story about this professor of nutrition at the University of Kansas that a few years ago decided to go on a little self-experiment to see if he could lose weight by only eating Little Debbie cakes. And at the end of his 10-week self-experiment, the professor found that he actually lost 27 pounds. And essentially what this professor was trying to do was to see uh, whether or not weight loss was purely driven by calorie intake or not. And as it turns out, it is. But on top of this professor also losing 27 pounds over the course of 10 weeks, his cholesterol levels improved and his uh, HDL cholesterol uh, went up, his LDL cholesterol went down, and he saw a reduction in triglycerides by 39%, which seems to indicate that not only is calorie intake the most important, if not the only factor that is involved with weight loss, but it also appears that calorie intake is intricately involved in overall health status as well. However, there are a few other details in this quote self experiment that I do want to touch on. Um, and so let's go ahead and dive right in. Now, I do think it is worth noting here before we move on that this idea that calorie intake is the most important factor um, when it comes to overall health status is fairly well established in the literature. This study in particular showed that a reduction in calories, but not a reduction in the quality of food led to reductions in blood lipids as well as um, improvements in cholesterol markers. And this study showed that restricting calorie intake could also improve insulin levels as well as insulin sensitivity. And this study showed that a reduction in calorie intake could also improve inflammatory markers. And this study showed that reductions in calorie intake could reduce oxidative stress. And this one shows that a reduction in uh, calorie intake intake could also lead to reductions in blood pressure as well. And so right out of the gate here, I do want to establish that when it comes to um, nutrition, one of the most important factors by far does appear to just simply be calorie intake. However, the major question here is, is this the only thing that matters? And I think the obvious answer to that question is absolutely not. Now, if we go back to the self-experiment of the professor, uh, contradictory to the headlines in regards to the self-experiment, uh, the professor was actually also consuming a protein shake per day as well as a multivitamin. But why, you might ask, and the answer to that question is that these are absolutely essential nutrients for the human body, and without them, you can actually develop some pretty severe uh, disease states. Now, him consuming these supplements likely had absolutely no effect on his experience of weight loss throughout this experiment. However, that also doesn't mean that they don't matter. Now, even though calorie intake does appear to be one of the primary, if not the primary driver of weight loss, as well as possibly overall health, nutrients also matter. Now, this point seems to be lost on some, especially those in the fitness, bodybuilding, weight loss community um, that tend to only want to talk about and focus on calorie intake and sometimes protein intake. And while there is some merit to focusing on these specific aspects of nutrition when it comes to weight loss specifically and bodybuilding for that matter, these are by no means the only important factors when it comes to overall nutrition. Nutrition. The conversation surrounding nutrition, especially in the online space, has been somewhat reduced to just a simple conversation on calories in, calories out, um, and protein intake. And um, we kind of have started to act as if the quality of food actually doesn't matter. And there's actually a ton of people in the nutrition space that would actually go so far as to say that just as long as you're hitting your calorie intake and as long as you're hitting your macros, you're good to go. Like even the professor at the end of that self-experiment kind of got to a point was like, well, maybe calories are only the only thing that matters when it comes to nutrition. But he himself was also taking a protein shake and a multivitamin. And the question there is, well, why were you doing that? And the obvious answer to that is because those nutrients 
absolutely matter to overall health and performance. Now, to some degree, I understand why people do this. When you get beyond the conversation on calories and protein, uh, the topic of nutrition does tend to get a little complex, and it's a whole lot easier to just bash somebody who doesn't affirm the doctrine of calories in, calories out, than it is to think critically and to develop a framework. And then you have people on the other end of the spectrum that just tend to just major on the minors and are just super hyper focused on fasting and feeding windows and medicinal mushrooms. And do these things matter? Maybe, probably to some degree. However, they don't matter near as much as people um, make them out to be. And so my point here is that I want to try to start a new conversation, a different conversation surrounding what actually constitutes a proper and good food decision or uh, eating pattern. And so for the rest of this video, what I want to do is communicate the framework that I personally use in order to determine this. Now, when it comes to this framework, there are typically two primary questions that I use in order to determine whether a food or eating pattern is a quality decision. And the first question is, is this food nutrient dense? And the second question is, does this food contain anything that I am sensitive to? Now, the first question here is by far the most important when it comes to quality food decisions and that is again whether or not a food is nutrient dense and to be honest can get somewhat complicated when you start to dive into the nitty gritty however in its simplest form a nutrient density is just the ratio of calories that are in a particular food uh, to the amount of nutrients that are in a particular food now something that is nutrient dense would be a food product that does not have a lot of calories but does have a lot of nutrients, whereas something that is not nutrient dense will have a lot of calories in it, but will not have a lot of nutrients in it. Now, in order to calculate or determine the nutrient density of a particular food, it is going to help us to actually define what a nutrient is. And um, a nutrient is typically defined as a compound or a substance that is absolutely essential for proper growth, development, and maintenance maintenance of life. Now, when you start to dive a little bit further into what a nutrient is, uh, you will notice that uh, nutrients are typically divided into two primary categories, the first being macronutrients, which are then further subcategorized into fats, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and water. And then you also have micronutrients, which are also subcategorized into uh, vitamins and minerals. Now, when you get into vitamins, vitamins can also be subcategorized into water soluble soluble vitamins and fat soluble vitamins. And when it comes to minerals, minerals can also be so categorized into uh, macro minerals and trace minerals. And now when it comes to most nutritional thinkers, most nutritional thinkers tend to kind of just camp out in the world of macronutrients. As we've already talked about, um, people love to just kind of argue over uh, calories and argue over how much protein you need in order to build and maintain muscle. They'll argue over what types of fats are best and how many carbohydrates you actually need in order to maintain performance. But in my opinion, these are just some of the basic questions and kind of surface level uh, topics when it comes to nutritional thought. Are they important? Yes, to some degree they are extremely important in helping to determine calorie intake and protein intake and fat intake and carbohydrate intake. However, what I want to try to bring a little bit more attention to is a discussion on micronutrient intake and what types of foods are best in order to meet our micronutrient needs. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of micronutrients that do get a lot of attention online, things like vitamin C and zinc um, and vitamin vitamin D. However, a lot of those conversations are happening in the context of supplementation. And I think the better question to be asking is what types of foods and eating patterns actually provide all of the adequate amounts of all of your essential vitamins and minerals. Now, this is not actually a question that I'm going to answer in this video. However, I do think it is one of the most important questions that we can start to ask when it comes to um, a proper diet and a proper uh, and proper food choices. Now, an example of a food product that is not nutrient dense would be something like table sugar that apart from its carbohydrate intake, which technically 
isn't even an essential dietary nutrient. It just doesn't contain almost any other nutrient. There's no essential fatty acids. There's no essential amino acids. There's no essential dietary minerals. There's no essential dietary vitamins. But it is packed with calories, which means if you overconsume uh, table sugar, you're going to be getting a lot of your uh, daily allotted calories that you do need, but not much else. And then on the other end of the spectrum, when it comes to foods that are nutrient dense, you have things like salmon, which contain a ton of essential amino acids, a ton of essential fatty acids, as well as micronutrient intake, things like vitamin D, vitamin E, a handful of the B vitamins, as well as minerals like calcium, selenium, and potassium. And so when it comes to foods that we're going to try to prioritize in our diet, salmon is obviously going to be higher on the continuum of foods that we want to uh, prioritize. And the reason for this is that you can only consume so many calories in a day. However, there are a ton of nutrients that your body needs throughout the day. And so in order to meet our micronutrient intake as well as our macronutrient intake, you're going to want to try to prioritize foods that are nutrient dense as opposed to foods uh, that are not nutrient dense. And this is the main issue with foods that are not nutrient dense. When you overconsume them, you end up overconsuming calories and underconsuming nutrients, which means that you end up being overfed and undernourished. Now, because of this, this is typically why foods such as kale and spinach have been looked at as quote superfoods, and it's because they contain on paper a ton of nutrients but not a lot of calories. And so, theoretically, you can consume a lot of these foods in order to help meet your nutrient needs without really contributing to your calorie needs. However, what this theory fails to take into account is that many of these, quote, superfoods like spinach and kale um, on paper contain a lot of nutrients. However, they also don't contain the right form of these nutrients many times. Now, a great example of this is with spinach in particular contains a lot of vitamin K. However, it is worth noting that there are two forms of vitamin K, vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. Now, vitamin K1 is primarily found in uh, plant foods such as spinach, whereas vitamin K2 is primarily found in fermented foods as well as animal products. Now, the issue here is that vitamin K1 has an extremely low absorption rate, whereas vitamin K2 has several times the amount of absorption that vitamin K1 does. And so meeting your dietary needs of vitamin K is a whole lot more efficient uh, through consuming fermented foods as well as consuming animal products when compared to things like spinach. And so not only is it important to pay attention to the nutrient density of the food, but it's also important to pay attention to the types of nutrients that are actually in those food. Do those particular nutrients absorb well? Are they in the correct form? And then on top of all this, it's also worth noting that uh, many of these food products also contain compounds that are uh, that literally bind to the nutrients that are in those food products, rendering them completely undigestible and completely unabsorbable. Now, a great example of this is a compound known as oxalate, which is found in extremely high amounts in, in food products such as uh, spinach that binds to the minerals that are in spinach and completely renders them undigestible and unabsorbable through the digestive tract. And so even though on paper spinach does have a lot of nutrients in it, um, a lot of these nutrients just don't get absorbed. And this is really something that um, needs to be paid attention to when you're trying to choose specific foods uh, that are actually nutrient dense and are actually going to provide you with the nutrients that are actually in them. Now, while we're on the topic of oxalates, it's probably a good time to bring up our second question um, to our framework in, in helping us to um, determine whether a food product is, is a good food decision. And that is, does this food contain any uh, compounds that I am sensitive to? And the reason for that is things like oxalates, uh, though they do bind to the minerals that are found in plants um, and plant products, products and specific other foods, uh, they're also can cause some fairly good damage to the human body as well. And a lot of and a lot of people are extremely sensitive to oxalates. Oxalates are actually the 
primary cause of kidney stones. And so the more oxalates that you consume through dietary means, the more likely you actually are in, uh, to develop kidney stones. And so I say all of that to say that there are specific food products that on paper do contain a lot of nutrients. However, one, they don't absorb properly because of the specific compounds that are found um, in those food products, and two, can actually cause some food sensitivities. Now, oxalates aren't the only compounds that are found in specific food products that can lead to food sensitivities. You also have things like phytates and lectins and saponins and enzyme inhibitors, as well as allergenic proteins such as gluten and dairy proteins such as casein. Now, a lot of people in the nutrition space like to minimize the impact that some of these uh, compounds can have on the human body. And to some degree, maybe there's some truth to the fact that not all of these are extremely detrimental to human health. However, it is safe to say that they don't have no effect. And so one of the biggest questions to ask when it comes to to these food sensitivities is who do they affect and to what degree do they affect? And to be quite frank, when you overconsume calories, it is actually more likely that you're going to develop food sensitivities. And so one of the best things that you can do in order to avoid being sensitive to various food products that are um, are in various compounds that are in various food products is just to maintain a healthy body weight and not overconsume calories. Now, in defense of the food products that contain a lot of these compounds that are um, cause issues to some individuals, it is worth noting that uh, specific cooking and preparation techniques can minimize the uh, the amount of these compounds that are in specific food products. However, I do believe it is still important to be mindful of these so that you can kind of keep an eye on how specific food products um, affect you specifically. Now, this is nowhere near an exhaustive framework when it comes to optimizing your health and nutrition. However, it is a fantastic starting point to not only keep an eye on your calories, but to also keep an eye on your nutrient intake and to prioritize uh, foods that are, uh, that are extremely nutrient dense and to minimize uh, foods that are not nutrient dense, and then to also begin to um, minimize foods that are uh, causing you food sensitivity issues and gut issues. Can you improve your health by only eating Little Debbie cakes? Probably, but it's not going to, at the end of the day, maximize your personal health and performance, which at the end of the day is what we're actually after. Now, other than that, guys, that's pretty much all I have for this video today. If you guys are interested in getting your hormones tested or getting a number of other home blood tests, make sure to check out the uh, link that's in the description for 25% off of a home blood test, as well as a link to the complete guide to supplementation that will walk you through every supplement that you uh, is worth taking for specific health goals. And so make sure to check those out if you haven't already. And if not, I will see you guys next time.